Awesome. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the full council meeting for the Council of Minnesota's of African Heritage. It is about 6.06, and we are calling the meeting to order. If I can have uh, someone from SEMA staff go ahead and give us a roll call. Would you like for me to go ahead and do that? Okay. Uh, Chair Hughes? Present. Vice Chair Doe? Present. Uh, Tre Treasurer Mullins is not going to be joining us today. She's out ill. Uh, Secretary Adams Lee? Present. Great. Uh, Council Member Daniels Juasame. Present. Council Member Crawford. Present. Council Member Nadi. Present. Council Member Winston. Council Member Dukes. And we know he will actually be um, late, so he's excused for 30 minutes. Okay. Okay, and Council Member Dahir is excused as well. He emailed us that he yep, would I did see that. Join us. Okay, uh, Senator Fate. Representative Hudson. Present. And then Representative Frazier. All right, that's it. Awesome, so if we can have um, someone uh, to adopt the meeting agenda, I just wanna make a slight amendment because I believe the last time that um, it was uh, Representative Hudson's first meeting and we didn't get a chance to introduce him. So I do want to be able to give him an opportunity just to introduce himself. Um, so if we can have someone adopt the meeting agenda with the adjustment of um, having Representative Hudson give a quick hello and background of who he is, and then we'll move into the approval of the March me meeting minutes. So if I can have a, an approval of that adjustment, that'd be great. So moved, Crawford. Thank you. Is there a second? So second. Doe. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Doe. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Any abstention? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hudson, I'm going to turn it over to you. If your camera's available, that'd be awesome. Um, good evening. So, uh, Representative, can you guys hear me all right? Yep, we can. Okay, good. All right, good. Representative Walter Hudson, um, represent District 30A, which is in Northeastern Wright County, first term Republican member of the House of Representatives. Um, and I come from a district that is, if my demographic page on the legislative website could be trusted, is 96% white, um, which is not the number I would have guessed based upon just going around day to day to the grocery store and taking my kids to school and watching them play on the street. A lot of diversity in my neighborhood, I guess. But uh, if you look at the district district as a whole, it's 96% white. And so, um, and that's kind of reflective of the communities that I've grown up in, frankly. Um, I was born in the Detroit suburbs uh, and my dad kind of worked his way up um, through various jobs until eventually bringing us here to Minnesota. Grew up in Cottage Grove. Um, and so I went to, to schools that were very reflective of the district that I now live in. Um, and so my interest in being on this council is to hopefully be able to act as something of a translator uh, for my constituents 
to try to help them understand um, things that historically have not been understood um, and be able to have a more productive relationship um, outstate than currently exists, at least as I see it. So. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, welcome again uh, to our council. So, so happy to have you and also Representative Frazier represented um, on the council. So with that, I'm going to move forward. Um, if I can have an approval of the March meeting minutes, um, if there were any corrections or additions, please mention those. And then if not, then let's go ahead and, and call for a motion for an approval. I move that we adapt the March minutes. Thank you, Vice Chair Doe. Um, is there a second? Second. I think well y'all kind of said it at the same time, <laughs> but I heard I heard Alfreda, I heard Council <laughs> Council I, I will, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> As a second, <laughs> not a problem. Um any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 If there's any oppose and any abstentions. Great, motion carries. Thank you so much, you all. Um, we're gonna move to the finance report. Um, Treasurer Mullins is not available to be here, so I believe um, staff member Ash is going to go through and give the report. Let me know, Let if, me know if, me, if you're unable to hear me. So um, we, for this month, for the, sorry, for the past month of March, 2023, we are in good standing. We have no negative numbers you can see on the report. We do have an unobligated balance of $113,194.95 as we have, as uh, our executive director Sloan has discussed in previous um, full council meetings, we do have we have an outline plan to spend down that number to zero by the end of the fiscal year as we are in a biennium and we cannot transfer that money over into fiscal year 2024. We do know that by the next month we should see a sharp decrease in these funds as of course we're hoping to we're hoping that you all approve the NECA creative uh, contract. We're also hoping that you then approve the um, Dion Consulting contract. And of course, as we do uh, make plans to upgrade our office technology and uh, pay for a variety of subscriptions that will support our work at the council, we'll start to see a bit more progress. Um, we also do have planned, we are also working with, um, set, we're also working with an event planner to put on an event to commemorate the fact that Juneteenth is now a state national holiday here in the state of Minnesota. So that will definitely also take up quite a bit of funds as well. So yes, any questions from anyone? No, thank you for that. I know we've had um, a lot of dialogue in reference to how we're going to spend down this money. So it is good to hear how we're expending it out um, because the obvious is, you know, you never want to give money back. Um, but just, you know, because it's being recorded and although we don't have any community, community members on, I would just say, um, you know, as a reminder that the way the SEMA um, department is set up, it's not necessarily set up from a programmatic perspective. So a lot of the, the dollars have been carried over due to staffing changes. Um, and at one point there wasn't any staff. And so that's also where a lot of those dollars, you know, are kind of holding strong, if you will. But I, I'm liking in the plans that I've heard thus far. And so we know that, you know, by June 30, um, we should see, you know, vast majority of that, if not all of it, um, expended out. 
Any questions from council members? And Chair Hughes, I just wanted to make one comment, if uh, if that's possible. Absolutely. Um, just wanted to make sure that everyone, uh, that you check your email box, because you should have per diem information in your box. Please get uh, a completed form in by Friday, if you can. It's to your benefit. This is money that you are owed per statute for showing up for these meetings and, and participating. So please get that in. If there are any discrepancies, uh, please contact me or Ash, and we will work that out. So thank you. Perfect. I know we did get note. Um, any other questions before I um, kind of move forward? with our agenda. Okay, so I know we did get notice that um, Dr. Barrage is gonna is running a few minutes late and then also um, we will have to ask our state demographer to come back because um, Susan Brower is not available um, you know to to present today. So because I do not see um, Dr. Barrage on here, I'm going to move forward with um, with our agenda items. Um, and also there's not, I'm just looking at the people and I do not see any community members on this call. So I think we can move forward and bypass public comment and go straight on to unfinished business. So this is more of a dialogue of anything. Um, how do we engage the governor's office and other legislative consultants? One of the things that we have been talking about, um, you know, with the council is being able to engage them a little bit more um, ongoing and not just around legislative session, um, but looking at, you know, some of the issues and opportunities that lie amongst African heritage um, community members um, and the population in general, and looking at what are some different ways that we can engage the governor's office. There are a lot of different initiatives that are going on when you look at the state holistically. Um, so I think that those are some things that we potentially could be looking at is where are some areas that we can kind of lean in, whether it's committees that um, the governor has or other legislative officials have, and how do we, you know, represent SEMA and or ourselves um, if it's applicable. And the reason why I say ourselves, because we all work for various agents, um, organizations that sometimes you may have to play, you know, that that double hat. So just wanted to open up to, to see if there were any ideas that you all had of other things that SEMA staff should be thinking about or that we should be thinking about as a council of various ways that we can engage with the governor's office, but then also our other legislative um, you know, constituents as well. Don't all speak at once. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioners, uh, this okay. is uh, uh, this is Crawford. Just wondering how we're going to backfill the gap that we know exists in communities with education because of the pandemic. Wanted uh, to stay engaged with the governor's office and their goals for getting our, our kids across the finish line. And I'll pause there. Yeah. Um, that's a good question, Carl, and I think that that's, that's the challenge, right, is that we know that there are um, some gaps, there are some holes, and there's only so much that we can do. I even think about, and I know although we've talked about this in the past, but I think about like where you are, you're in Duluth, so how are we showing yeah. up? you know, and engaging in Duluth. I know we used to have, you know, an office at Rochester and, and you know, economically it just was not, it didn't make sense for us to, you know, to, con to continue that. And so we ended up closing that down, but you, you do raise uh, excellent points of what are next steps and how do we, you know, fill those gaps? Who are we not connected to that we need to be considering to be connected to? Yes, and, and you know more than I that the same pain is felt in higher education, too, when we look at uh, the number of students of color who had either dropped out or stopped their journey of education uh, because of the pandemic. Yeah, 
and, and it's harder to get them back to being engaged. You know, I, I would look at my own institution and even across the landscape, you know, of two year institutions and potentially four year. I notice what we've seen is an uptick in the enrollment. But then from a sustainability perspective, from a retention, you know, or completion, um, we're not keeping them. You know, so what's going on there? And we know that there's a lack of um, student supports that are needed. We know that there has been an increase in mental health, um, food insecurities. Um, I mean, so there's so many different things that we could talk about, even from a higher education lens. But even I think about um, secondary lens as well, and even early childhood, you know, um, what's, what's going on there and how are we, um, addressing some of those concerns? So I think, you know, what you're raising are concerns that we could probably, you know, connect with the governor's office to say, what are you doing and how can we help? Maybe we can be that conduit or that liaison to either pull, you know, the like community members together or other, um, key stakeholders that can help get at this gap. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Other comments, Wayne, I know you had unmuted. Yes, I did. I did. And Carl, uh, Council Member um, Carl made a very good point. At the same time, w- one of the things I was trying to look at as well as far as engagement is concerned is just having the opportunity to, as a council, you know, I know our staff probably engage with, with the legislators on a daily basis or however to do that. But just as a council, if we can find a way to have some direct visits, and I don't know again whether, uh, in terms of meeting in person, is is a feasible way of getting to them. But as a council, just design design a way where we can make some legislative visit on behalf of the council to address the particular issue that we can identify with uh, the legislators, because. Uh, we don't know them one on one in person, you know. And 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 Representative Hudson, welcome, uh, definitely, you know. So we need to get to know them and and talk to them and and you know just engage them with the issues that they are working on. And like you said, uh, Chair Hughes, how we can actually help in bringing those forward to our community. So as a council, you know, if we can do that, I don't think we've done it in the past. But if we can look at the possibility of doing something like that, we probably do it individually. I know other council members probably do that. But on behalf of the council, if we do something like that, I think it would be beneficial. That would be my suggestion. Why not? No, thank you for that. <laughs> Others, comments in reference to this? And this is not a one and done conversation. Let me just say that as well. So. Um, we definitely want to have more dialogue and just kind of, you know, have some ideation and other thoughts around what could this potentially look like. Um, and I think that there is definitely opportunity for us to be able to, you know, do such a thing. So I'm going to pause if there's no other comments, because I do see that Dr. Barrage is on. And so I want to introduce, um, you know, and I'm hoping maybe she can tell us a little bit about both roles here. I know originally we had invited her um, deputy commissioner for MDE for Minnesota Department of Education, but also um, most recently has been appointed as um, the chief equity officer um, for the new office of uh, equity and opportunity. So happy to bring forward. And Stephanie, we just see you typing. <laughs> we don't see your face. Can you see me? No. Oh, sorry. There you go. <laughs> I'm running into some issues, but you know, they moved my computer. So I'm trying to get this to another section. So I got to keep that open. I'm glad you said it. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to introduce and, and turn it over to you, Dr. Stephanie Barrage. <laughs> it is good to see everyone. You know how you get in, you go, oh, I'm trying to get this in. <laughs> trying to make sure that I got everything in space. Now, can you see me? Yes, we can. <laughs> Wonderful. And I will talk about both areas as long as Thank you, you. Can you see the mind, body, and soul? No. So that's not and being that's shared yet. Right. Hold on. I got to escape. Okay. Back. I need to share my screen. Hold on a second. That's what we're going to do. Right. We share this screen. I'm excited to be here today. Ha 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 ha. Share. There we go. There we go. All right.
Now, it's not letting me share the screen. I'm on this new computer and I don't know if everything is as it should be. I don't have my old computer, but let's try this here. Can you now see? Yes. Perfect. There we go. All right. We're going to get this. We're going to work with this. All right. <laughs> It is so good to see everyone this evening. I am glad. Thank you for being patient. Um, another, look, adjustment is, as I'm working in the Capitol, I literally, my last meeting was at five. By the time it took me to walk to my car, traffic was atrocious. I have not had to deal with a traffic like that in a while. So thank you for being, um, as I said, patient with me. So there's a lot going on. As you no, we had, of course, worked through the mind, body, and soul convening the Black community. I think, did you have conversation around that, or are people aware of it? Okay, then let's get started. So we started Mind, Body, and Soul a year ago, actually a year ago in April. It started a little bit before that, I, when we were having conversations with the governor's office, and the governor specifically, around listening to the Black community. And so... We wanted the governor and the lieutenant governor to come into a setting where they were listeners. And we wanted them to hear the concerns, and I say concerns, positives, things that are going well, things that are not going well, how to make Minnesota the best state for Black families. And to do that, we wanted to bring the commissioners in to talk about what they were pushing to support Black families, but then we wanted people in a space to be able to tell the, the commissioners and the governor, lieutenant governor, here's what's working for us. Here's what's not. These are the things that we need. And from that, we had Mind, Body, and Soul convening the Black community. And so each com convening, we dealt with an area, education and the Black family, Black business and workforce development, home ownership, um, affordable housing, Black children and families, health in the Black community. And so when we put this together, I'd probably say we have about 700 to 800 people right now who's on our listserv, who get the information, and they engage with us in different ways. We have about 100 participants who come to the meetings every time we have Mind, Body, and Soul. But then we have people who may not who may not attend Mind, Body and Soul, but they are reading the information and they're filling out the surveys and telling us, providing feedback as well from what they've read, because we make sure that we send the information to people, to everyone on our listserv. Um, we really wanted in this space the information to be a part of the governor's budget. So if you remember, for those of you that don't know, back in, I want to say, maybe December, January-ish, we spent one week and literally, and people were like, please don't do that to us again, because um, we were back to back where we went through what mind, body, and soul participants said they wanted. And then we put it side by side with, here's where it shows up in the governor's budget. Because that was major conversation in the beginning that we are tired of coming to the table to just talk about things. Now we want to see it. We want to make sure that what we have asked for made its way into the budget. So we start, so that happened. And we learned some things. We learned quite a few things. Um, Black Minnesotans wanted a consistent experience voice in government. They wanted to see tangible changes and not just discuss change. They wanted to make sure that the resources are making their way to the community at large, and let me be very specific, and not just in small amounts. People don't wanna fight for the same money. Um, they wanted to see a path, they wanted to make sure that there was pathways to see themselves, be it through education, teacher recruitment, mental health, affordable health care, home ownership, removing the barriers, housing programs, and investing in the black community. And so we also went through a, a phase of, I don't know if everyone really understands the budget process at the state level. So here's what we did. We went through some trainings on, here's what the process looks like. It begins in January and let's go there. It begins in January where the legislative committee start to build their own budget. But people are actually working on the budget late fall. Uh, no, as we go into July, as soon as everything ends in in 
June. July is when people start really putting the budgets together. And it wasn't until I started working at MDE that I realized, I don't know if everyone understands this budget cycle and, and people now have to see it. So we walked through that process. And then we started to look at, again, how do things align? So that's kind of what was happening on the mind, body, soul side. But then, so now when you drill down and get to the Minnesota Department of Education, because you're right, this was my, a lot of my learning was based around, of the system was based around MDE. And so as I'm sitting here, I'm also in this space of, here are the things that I think people should want to see, because now that I'm in the system, I'm going, eh, here are some things that really need to shift because I'm in it and I'm seeing it differently. So this is a good example for MDE's budget. What we heard, black students are suspended at higher rates. We know mm -hmm. that. Black students are more frequently required to take remedial courses in college. Minnesota ranks close to the last for graduation rates for black students. Disparities were deepened by the pandemic. So here was the proposal out of mind, body and soul. They wanted grant funding for schools to implement alternatives to expulsionary discipline. Now, this is important. If you would have looked at a previous proposal, you're going to see the word NED because that's the language that was being used, non-exclusionary um, discipline. But when we got into mind, body, and soul, people said, we don't know what NED is and why are you using that language? We feel like you are hiding something. So give us language that we know. Because really what you're talking about for some, that's more than that, but it was for some, you're talking about suspensions and not suspending students. So the community members were saying, please don't give us jargon, say what it is. So that's when we went into, what are we gonna do to make sure that we're working on our policies and practices around alternatives to exclusionary discipline? How are we gonna provide that support at the state level? Um, to assist districts. So here's where it shows up. This is where it showed up in the governor's budget. So this is how we managed everything. Here's what you told us, here's where it showed up. So we did, Governor Watson, Lieutenant Governor, and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan's budget supported Minnesota's youngest learning with funding strategies to keep them in the classroom and addresses in-school and out-of-school suspensions, which are primary drivers of discipline disparities. The budget funds grants to support schools to coordination and training to help teachers get away from the practice of alternatives to suspensions and shift away from punitive and exclusionary school practices towards restorative practices. Now, let me say this, how it's played out, there are multiple conversations happening right now because people have been talking about this for the last five years and because there wasn't movement, this is a good example. We are talking about things. Now they're at the space where we can get movement and the conversation is shifting a little because it really is sitting in our lap of, we've got to build this out correctly to make sure that we are meeting the students' needs of what's happening. And so the governor was very clear, look, this is my budget, but once it starts to go through the process, it has to work. We have to have agreement between the House and the Senate. So that's what's happening right now. There's a lot of discussions around what does that look like? And as you know how this process works, will it? Will everyone agree to all the pieces that are in place? So I just want you to get a feel of this is what was working its way through MDE's budget. So here we go. What we heard culturally specific or need after school hours of support um, for each family because they have different needs. Need wraparound services for health disparities and access to health services is challenging. So then we put in the proposal, after school community learning, free universal meals. We all know this was approved. We now will move forward that there will be free universal meals for all students. That has been voted on and approved through both the House and the Senate. So here, this is a good example of how this is showing up and, and what's being worked through. So engaging youth out of school, we've got to have something. This helps our families because think about it. As parents, if I know that my child is somewhere safe to go in the community, 
with the people that are that are from the community, then that is also helping the family. So if I'm getting off work and you know, so I'll speak of myself. I have three children getting off work and going to pick up the kids right away or having the kids dropped off on the school bus right away from school. I may need time to get dinner. I may need time to uh, make sure that my kids are getting tutoring because everyone does not get off work. I, look, I don't, as you just see me getting home at six o'clock. So if I don't get off work at that time, then I need to make sure that my children are safe somewhere until I'm able to get home. So these wraparound services are really important to families. So what else did we hear? Students need to see themselves in the classroom and our teaching workforce needs diversification. Students need support in career pathways. So this is where you're gonna get into the recruitment and retention of black teachers. What is the short-term recruitment process, the long-term, and how do we retain our staff? Recruitment and retaining caring and qualified educators, that was in the governor's budget. Helping more students become teachers, so they're building this in the pathway for students while they're in high school, so that there are pathways for students to say, if teaching is where you really want to be, and we can then share with students what that looks like early on, and it could be in their pathway, then there should be funding to help the students work their way through teacher programs. Compass is a program that was put in place during um, COVID, and it really is to provide support to through literacy, math, social, emotional learning, mental health, um, to help educators to provide the best supports. We know that we also must address literacy. So I'm going through all the pieces that people said we need support in. Full service community schools. If I can go to my school, my community school, and get, see the dentist, if I can have medical support, if I can even have someone there that may be able to help me with housing opportunities, that's what we're looking for. A one-stop shop, so it's a full-surf community schools that also helps families with time. I'm not running all over the place. I know that I have a provider that's right there in the school if my student needs to see, my child needs to get that support always expanding rigorous coursework to make sure that there's IB, AP, PSEO, CTE courses in schools. We heard that loud and clearly. So definitely providing in the governor's budget, multi-tier systems of support for learning, addressing the literacy achievement from birth to grade 12, expanding full service community schools so that there's funding in place, expanding rigorous coursework. And so those are the pieces that we worked on at MDE to align to that budget. Hold on. There we go. So though I wanted you to see the tie-in to both so that you could see this is what it looks like. And this is what our budget, the from what we heard from my body and soul and how that tied into the MDE budget. Now that's what I was asked to talk about originally, but you're right, things have changed. <laughs> and so as I'm now in this new role of the chief equity officer, the great thing is the, the work that I did, and so this was great for me and, and me in the sense of it's helping me in this new position, instead of just providing that work and support with just MDE, now I'm working across the state agencies with all of the commissioners, with everyone across um, the enterprise to make sure that this work continues um, and that there's enough support in place for the needs of um, all and, and multiple groups. And so I've had multiple groups reach out to say, we want what you've done with mind, body and soul for our community. That really has been clear. Um, we want that same access that you've had um, with mind, body, and soul. So that's a good example of how it is we're trying to help that piece. 
I may need someone to read the questions for me if you can. Yeah, no, first of all, thank you. I mean, lots of good information uh, really does kind of get into, in essence, where we kind of started, where we, one of the things that we said is how do we engage with the governor's office? So perfect timing to have you here specifically, you know, now that you're in this different, that you will be into this different role. Um, so council, um, Councilperson Lee, uh, Councilwoman Lee had asked, um, I'm wondering when we have an have a deliberate gifted and talented funded and staffed for our children instead of overly saturated special education. So Correct. when we, when we kind of have that uh, versus uh, special education is is the question that she's throwing out there. And so I'm going to put my former superintendent hat on because <laughs> because this this helps too. Um, and it really does. This is where your voice as parents and as community members helped me. When I sat as a superintendent, um, in fact, I'm going to show you how this showed up. When I first started at Robinsdale, and this is when I walked in the door, someone gave, they gave me the gifted and talented plan that had not been presented, but they said, Barrage, go to the next meeting and present this. Now, I'm not crazy and I'm not a fool. And I said, I need time to look at this because I want to see it and see, does it really meet the needs of what is needed in the district? What I learned that day is there was a group of parents who are connected to the gifted and talented community who they were not meeting at the school. They were meeting at a restaurant near the district. And at that point, I needed to make some shift. Now, I have no problem with the group meeting as parents at the restaurant. But what you now have just done is taken away the work of the school so that it touches all children and you are having a parent meeting off-site, which you should have parent meetings off-site to connect as parents. But we weren't having those meetings. We weren't having district meetings on-site and at, that, at the district. And so once I shifted that, now I'm bringing in a representative from every building and we did a major shift in gifted and talented in Robbinsdale because of that. And, and literally went into, I now don't want, and, and you have to look at the data. If you look at gifted as just those kids that, that sit in a certain space, you're, you're not getting to the tap. And I want you to hear that. If you just go off of the true term of gifted, then you're saying the top 2% of a district, and that then, then I've lost the talent. So we shifted to make sure that every school had gifted and talented support, not just, and, and literally took it in sections, K through two, two, three through five, and then middle school, and then we worked our way up. Because once you get into high school, you're looking at it, it's the IB, it's the AB, it's the, that's the rigorous yep. coursework. And so some parents pushed back to say, well, we want, it, it should really only be the top 2%. And when you start to really, so then I knew we had to do some teaching and educating around, again, gifted and talented. But I needed the parents from the other schools to be in the space to have the conversation, because when they're not there, then people make decisions for you and it may not meet your, your child's needs. So I'm going to say that to you to say those decisions also are made at the local level. And you need to be people have to be engaged at the local level to ensure that. And I'm going to say this, that schools are held accountable to the needs of the parents and community. And so here's something else that I also learned. Whereas COVID was as challenging for families because we dealt with, let's be honest, a pandemic. There were some things that we learned that was a benefit to us, which I knew early on. When people say parents do not show, used to say parents don't show up to conferences, it was amazing to me that we had 100% participation during the pandemic because of just what we're able to do right now. If I'm managing my children, which I am, because I've had kids, I can't always make it to the school, but we can connect. If, if it's about parent engagement, I can connect with you virtually. And so that was also a shift that was made because now you're getting information and feedback from parents in the safety 
of their own home. So I want to say that again, in the safety of their home. So there are some spaces of, and that was another thing, I met by affinity groups with my parents so that I could hear from them specific to their needs. And I'll never forget there was a um, parent who called and she said, well, I'm not invited to the African-American group. And I said, because you have an affinity group. And she said, what do you mean? I said, you have the PTA. And I said, and you have another group that you sit in. So we're trying to make sure that the door is open for people to be able to share the things that they need in the space that they sit in. So yes, gifted and talented, there there surely needs to be um, support. But that also sits at the local level to get that support. Um, and now there is funding. Schools receive funding for gifted and talented services. The question is, is it enough? And I'll always say it's never enough funding. And two, do you know what your what your district is using with that funding? And are they using it to meet the needs of students who, who may look like you and I? No, that makes sense. So I have a couple more questions in here. So Representative Hudson has two. One, um, he says, are these mind, body, and soul listening sessions in person? And are they available um, for legislators to attend? So they are not in person. Um, what we do is they are virtual. And, and we did one in person. That did not work. People like the, <laughs> we won't do that again. We And we, there's some things that we try and go, does this really work? Um, it did not work because people like being virtual. We have more engagement this way. Um, and so, yes, what it now, I've had a couple people ask or, or to ask, can we attend? And I'm going to, I would make the same statement that the, the governor um, and Lieutenant Governor manages well. We'd love to have you, love to, but you sit as a listener because that is clear. In this space, even the governor and lieutenant governors, they open to say welcome and then they are listeners. This space is for people, for you to listen to what the community is saying to you. And, and actually in one of the beginning meetings, and, and Linda may remember this, um, early on we started, they, it's just human nature. You want to, if some, if you're in one of the breakout sessions and someone says something uh, that you, that may not be right, you want to correct it right then. But the problem is we've got 12 to 15 breakout sessions and you can't correct it for everyone. So we really, it, the space is for us to listen and not correct it. And so, yes, we would love to have you um, in the room, but you are coming in as a listener uh, because we received a lot of feedback from people to say, this is our space to talk. And we really don't want to fight with people who are in position, who have information, because we get them that information once it's over and then we send it back. We, we give them the correct information after the fact. So we'd love to. And then the other um comment that Representative Hudson made was hearing a lot of anecdotal pushback on non-exclusionary discipline mandate, concerns about safety and ability of other students to learn with disciplinary distractions. Yes. How would you answer um, with such concerns? So let me, so I'm going to also put on my former principal hat. <laughs> and that's been a great space for me to be in um, because I get it. So, and it is a balance. So let me say this, there is a balance around um, exclusionary practices. So I'm going to answer it this way. Recently, when I was a superintendent in Robbinsdale, I received a call one day from a parent who said, my child is not, is getting, being kicked out of class every day. And so watch the language. I go to the school and I ask the principal, is this student being kicked out every day? And the principal said, the student is not being suspended. And I said, let's talk through that. Is the student being excluded from class every day? And this student had been excluded from class every day. And what was happening is, whereas it wasn't listed as a suspension, so, so let's talk data, the student would be sent to the principal's office to sit in the principal's office for at one point when I walked in, the student had been in there for two hours. 
Mm. You can't have that because you are excluding a student from their education. And if that happens over and over, what do you do? Now, this goes back to if there are issues that are happening in the classroom, I'm going to say as a principal, there's three, three ways that I would look at this. Do I need to, do we need to bring the team together to look at, do I need to provide support? Do we need to provide additional support for the teacher? Do we need to provide additional support for the student? And do we need to then again and bring, and when I say additional support, parents included, we need to come together to talk about what supports, which is why I'm going to community schools are great because now I've got some wraparound services right there in the school that can help the child. That takes time and staff and funding to do that. So yes, you are going to hear people that are going to say, we don't, the, well, how do you manage the extreme behavior? And that's what it comes down to. Is it extreme? And, and I say extreme, extreme. If a student is being, um, or a staff is, is being assaulted, that's, there are some things that should happen with that. You're not going to hear me say any, no one should be in an unsafe situation. So I don't sit in that space at all. But then what happens to the child if that continues on a regular basis? And that's happening in our schools. Because either we're not getting the student to the best support that they need. And the parent is saying, my child still needs to be educated. You cannot keep sending my child home. Or you can't keep excluding them because you're going to pay the price somewhere. Because if the student is out of the classroom, they're also not learning. And if they're not learning, then they're not getting the education that, that we have said by law that we will provide. So um, I don't know if we have great answers yet, and I think people are sitting in the in the middle, and that's why this conversation around um, exclusionary practices has been different this term because we are sitting in a space where we can actually make some changes and not just not just um, discuss it in a space where nothing is going to happen. In fact, one of the and you know this, one of the um, staff members said. We've been talking about this for five years, but now we're at a place to really do something about it. Now what? How do we work our way through that? And let me also say this, and you're also coming out of a time when there was different behaviors prior to COVID. We know that our students have walked out of COVID and had some mental health challenges that we needed to address, as well as our staff as well. So it is making sure that we have the supports in place for our staff and our students so that they can be successful. I hope I answered that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Council Member Doe, Vice Chair Doe. You had put, um, I think it blanked out, so that's why I couldn't see it, but now I see your question. Um, oh. So he just says, thank you for the work um, you are doing. How can one get on your mailing list to attend these sessions? So all you have to do is send this, uh, Linda or someone will make it so that it gets to Nicole and we will get you on the list. Perfect. That's simple. Our list keeps growing and growing. And so, uh, again, we started with uh, 100 plus. We have grown to, uh, I think our list, like I said, we go between 800. It keeps it keeps growing because once people heard about it, they were like, we want in. And even so, let me say this, even in some of the spaces, um, if you remember when the um, Tennessee, we uh, watched the uh, young man get uh, beaten by the police. We pulled people together. We pulled people right after that to, for people to go into some healing circles. Um, so it, it has been a space. We wanted to make sure it was a space for people to be able to um, share, manage what is happening to us um, every day and um, how we can be effective in making change quickly, quickly. No, that's awesome. Other questions for Dr. Barrage? Um, yes. I mean, great insight. Go ahead, Carl. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, 
Ms. Mirage, congratulations on your new appointment. Thank uh, you. One question I have, uh, how are we uh, cutting the cost for kids to uh, participate in after-school sports? You know, with the price of inflation and everything going up, uh, that is a cost that's stopping our kids from participating yes. and connecting. And so, and, and depending upon, again, this is a district piece um, around how to, where are funds being allocated? So I'm gonna keep saying this. So, so watch how this works. If we did this with mind, body, and soul, you have to do this in the schools as well because the schools are locally controlled. And so if you want to make that change, people have to be in the room to say, here's where we would like to see funding go. I want to say that out loud again. If you're not in the room, mm -hmm. then people make decisions for you. And you have to be in the room because those are locally controlled decisions. In fact, districts are in their budget process right now. Think about it. If you don't have someone at the table sharing with the board, and so, and, and let me put it this way. You always don't have to be in person. You can send in your information by email to all the board members and to the superintendent to say, here are the things that we want. And we are parents or community members. And then I can't surely set up to say, I want to see how you're spending. You can, because again, if you're in partnership, what's the, what is the, what are, what is being spent per school on athletics? Yes. Do you know that? And so these are when you're going to start to drill down into the questions. What sports are being, who gets the most dollars? School to school. Yes. So I would say for that, those are those locally controlled decisions. But if you're not at the table, you don't know how much money is coming in and what they're spending. Because then what you could actually see is, is one group getting more than the other? Are, you know, how is it equitable across the, the district for all the sports? And are there is there money from other spaces that can come in to assist? Thank you. And athletics is expensive. Gender. What'd you say? And equity and gender. What, and what equity and are... gender. Yes. Thank you. Yep. I, we, I, I'm in an organization, and one of the things that we are doing in our organization um, is starting to send people to board meetings. Mm. We're starting to send people in board meetings and making sure that someone is in that audience um, during the listening time to let them know we're here, we're watching. No, oh, that's good. So, um, yeah. staff member... Um, so Theo Rose says, thank you for your insights, Dr. Barrage. The proposal to prohibit um, K through third grade dismissal is particularly important. Please speak to the importance of high quality education and support services for young elementary school students yeah. and their families, including strategies for keeping them in the classroom. And so that so you're, we're getting right into the conversation that that MDE is, is as we're looking at. How do you make sure that you're not excluding students from from classrooms. And so some of this does come into, now we have grants right now where we are providing to districts and we're training because some of this also comes down to, and so I, I always use my own example. Uh, when I started teaching back in 91 here in Minneapolis, I had never met a Hmong student. Never. First thing I did was I had to talk to the kids to say, you've got to help me Make sure that you see yourself in, in the curriculum. Now, discipline and behavior was not an issue for me as a teacher. In fact, I'll say this. When I first started teaching, and I hadn't been there for maybe six months, they were bringing other teachers into my classroom for behavior. And I'm going to say this. I started teaching when I was 22 here in Minneapolis. So I'm coming from a space of relationships matter. I still have connections and relationships with my students that are sitting here in Minnesota today. 
relationships matter. When I have a relationship with you, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I didn't have kids who didn't have sometimes some issues. But I'm gonna, but my kids knew I was doing everything that I could to connect with them. So that also helps in some of the spaces. I didn't live at that point as I lived in Minneapolis. I also made sure that I shopped in Minneapolis, but I shopped in my neighborhood where my kids were at. I also did home visits. Now, I do understand everyone is not comfortable doing that. I get that. But those were the things that worked for me because I'm from a small town and that's the only thing that I knew at that point was to how to connect. And so even as a principal, we would do home visits in groups. But again, if that does not happen, then, and you're right, there's privacy issues. There's other things that, that happen now that sometimes they get in the way with that. However, we have to continue to have the conversations. And so I'm going to push in each district, there needs to be conversations around what those exclusionary practices look like in the districts that, that we're in. And let's be honest, we're in all districts. Yeah. So if you're not having, if you're not asking the questions around what is it, what is your exclusionary practices look like? Or let me go even, even up to another level. What's the student handbook look like? Because everyone's student handbook is different. And we have to help and educate. So what, what we're talking about right now is what things can be put in statute to help that process, but there still is the process at local control. What do you, what does it look like in the handbook and how do you have those conversations? So I'll even go deeper than that. One of the things that when we got to Robbinsdale that the students shared with us, they said, oh, kids are getting suspended. Think about this. Here's a barrier and a bias. Small students would not be suspended for clothing attire that larger students would be suspended for, for dress code violations. And so the kids would say, oh, we know we don't get sent home because our bodies don't look that way. They're sending the other people home or we're in class all day violating the dress code and no one says anything to us. Mm -hmm. So it's also, what do we see? Yeah. And do I see behavior over here in this student, but I don't see behavior over here, and they're doing that, they've got the same behavior, but they get a pass because that is real. There's a discrepancy in suspension, and black students are suspended at a higher rate, period, across our state. You you cannot get the data shows that. Yeah. So I am going to, um, Council Member Dukes has a question. And this will be a last question because I know we're already over time, but it's, it's been such a fruitful inform, um, information. Um, so it says, is it true that funds are allocated based on student enrollment and that smaller schools tend to be those in African heritage communities? And the second part of that question is, how do we advocate for those schools that are systematically underfunded? And so I'm going to sit here. I think all schools uh, do not have enough funding. And that's based around multiple reasons. So I won't go down that path because that'll be a whole nother 20 minute conversation. Um, however, yes, there's a student allocation. There's a there's a funding stream around per pupil. It's called per pupil funding. Mm -hmm. So you get a per pupil, you get an amount of money for every student that sits in your district. However, I'm going to explain it this way. <clears throat> so let's say if my daughter, Octavia, is sitting in a classroom. However, Octavia may have some, have some additional needs. So if each student gets the same amount of money, that's great. But Octavia may need speech. She may need other supports. So really, that per pupil funding won't cover everything that Octavia needs. Now, you may get some other funding streams, such as SPED or through the federal or through title, but it's not going to cover everything then that cost to educate Octavia, which really could have been, let's say if it's $5, and really to educate Octavia cost $50, then that school district has to use their general fund to pay the difference, to pay the $45, if everybody got five, 
to cover that up. So then when people say districts are going, they didn't manage their money well, it's not that they didn't manage their money well and watch what else happens in the process. Funding, we get our, we base our funding of our budget. We, every district has to budget and have their approved budget by the end of June. We base that off of our projections of what we think students that will show up. So if we based our projections off of 500 students, but 300 show up, we have an issue. And it takes a school district, think about that, a year to, to actually manage that because now you have a couple things. I either have to lay off the difference of the teachers and it's not just teachers. It's teachers, it's the, the EAs, it's the food staff, it's everyone that touches that child or that district. And then, and that's only based on if contracts align that way, and if not, then again, I now have to cover that expense for that year until I get to the next year when I can say we've got to cut back. And then that's happened to me, too, where you cut back and then 50 other students show up that you didn't plan on. And now you don't have enough staff to manage them. So it's a it's a balancing act um, for educators. And we don't always have those conversations either. No. Mm -hmm. No, that that I mean, this has been good. I know um, Council Member um, Adams Lee. So I know, and I think you had typed this question in as um, as something that um, Dr. Barrage was saying. So I'm just going to ask the question, and if you can unmute and clarify, um, it just says how our staff who support these concerns are not professionally targeted. Um, many are intimidated to speak up. And I think right. this was in relation to, um, I believe it was in relation to what uh, Theo either was saying or something that you had said earlier in reference to just how, um, where our student supports are needed. And this is where the this is where I'm going to say the partnership comes because I, I get what you're saying. You heard me say groups. You heard me say one of the organizations that I'm in right now, we're starting to send people to the board meetings because that's how we're starting to help our community is by showing up. Because you're right, all parents are not uh, comfortable. And let me say this, and all staff members may not be comfortable for fear of retaliation. So sometimes you need groups behind you to help back you to say, this is a concern for us in this community and we're standing with them because we may have an, uh, an expertise and support to go in numbers. No, that's awesome. Yeah, I agree. Th this has been great. Um, we can't thank you enough. We definitely are going to have to bring you back as you, you know, kind of dig in yeah. a little bit more um, into your new position and, and hear where we can collaborate together um, you know, that's what we're here for. That's what we're supposed to be doing, yep. you know, as as the council so that we can lean in and dig in a little bit more. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are welcome to stay on. But I'm sure you are like, I'm tired. <laughs> Love y'all, but no. <laughs> and I would let me say this. I, in my plan, it I will be coming back because this uh, is our, awesome. I see us as, as partners in this. And so even if it's quarterly, I plan to come back. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, you. Great information. Um, and we will definitely stay in touch. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Have a good Thanks. day. Take care. You too. All right. So let's kind of move on um, to the, the only other um, unfinished business item was our meeting structure. Um, we have been talking about this <laughs> for such a long time, um, saying, do we want to eventually get back to in-person meeting? And I know right now we're still kind of, you know, within this virtual space. Um, we don't have to necessarily call it out right now. I know one of the things that we had mentioned is that for our May meeting, we had talked about being in person. Um, but part of me says, I'm wondering if we're going to end up pushing it out to June and kind of culminating it with, you know, kind of a Juneteenth um, celebration or something to that manner. Um, so I just wanted to kind of put that out there. I think what I will probably have um, the SEMA staff do is send out a poll to see, you know, do we want to keep 
the meeting cadence as is, or do we want to move it to a face-to-face? I know eventually we would do face-to-face. And even if, as we go into the next fiscal year, um, one of the other options is to do something maybe every other um, meeting where um, one month is uh, virtual and then another month is face-to-face, or we can even spread it out where the winter months <laughs> are virtual and then maybe the summer months are, um, are are in person just because in that way you don't have to worry about, which we have in the past have had to do that where due to weather concerns, we have had to make um, the decision to cancel. So that was really the only other thing. Any thoughts on that? Um, on what I just mentioned as far as the meeting structure? Okay, I'm like, I'm seeing some heads um, that are nodding that, you know, no, nothing in particular. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to new business. So we do have two proposals. I'm gonna ask um, Executive Director Sloan, if you can kind of walk us through the two proposals. These are items that have to be voted upon today. Um, so that we can kind of get moving. But if you want to talk about these two items, um, that would be great. And then after those two items and after the vote, then um, we're going to turn it back over to you all for the staff reports. And maybe we'll end before eight o'clock tonight. We'll see. (laughs) Catch some of the sunshine, right? Right. (laughs) Okay. Uh, So first up is the um, NECA creative report. Okay. So this this particular proposal is mostly focused on branding and marketing. Uh, one of the things that as, as we've gone through time, especially over the last couple of years since I've been here, a lot of people don't know really who we are. Some people still think we're the Council for Black Minnesotans. Some people don't know necessarily know our connection to the governor and the legislature and um, our mission. And so what we love to do is uh, have someone define, help us define who we are uh, based on what the community says, based on what the statute says, based on the needs of the community. So the proposal from NECA Creative is first to do some listening and learning from the board members, from the community, possibly from some legislators. Um, And that would be done through some one-on-one interviews, maybe a couple of focus groups. Uh, They would be writing the creative brief and coming up with, okay, here are some thoughts on who, who and who we think you should be and where you should be, what you should look like. Uh, that it would also include media planning as well as coming up with an ad campaign. We need people to know who we are, why we're here in order for them to connect with us, in order for them to trust us, because it really is about being in the community, understanding the needs and the issues, being able to bring back that information, translate it in in a form that would be beneficial to um, try to drive legislation in a positive manner manner for the community. So they would be working on that. They'd be working on different concept elements which would be um, whether it's, you know, radio, print, uh, looking at some things like um, experiential elements, banners, tablecloths, all kinds of things that's related to, again, promoting and branding who we are. Uh, This particular proposal also includes media buys as well as some stock photography. So right now it's at $25,000. It will not go over $25,000, but it could possibly uh, come under depending upon exactly once they get going, once they find out. So I am asking the board to uh, accept this proposal We know that NECA Creative does some fantastic work. They've been doing our annual report for the the last three years. Uh, They do a lot of work for the state, branding work for the state. And I believe that they could do um, a a really good job with branding us for both the African-American community as well as African immigrants and everyone that's under the African um, diaspora. So that is the NECA creative proposal that's on the table right now. Questions, comments, or concerns in reference to what Linda just 
outline. Sounds good to me. I mean, definitely, I, I concur in the fact that they do really, really good work. Uh, the question would be: Is there a timeline as far as you know when they're gonna, if, if, if they say we give the contract and they're going to roll it out? Is it the next six months? We're going to see these things happening, or three months? Or yes, there is a timeline. By the end of the fiscal year, all this work will be done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we're, we're 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 very aggressive with this. So, so right. that's that is the plan to get this done by that time. By that time, sounds good. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Chair Hughes. This is Councilmember Dukes, um, Ed Sloan. Um, this is great, and I think much needed in terms of lifting our profile in the community. I'm just wondering, and you may have said this, if we're also thinking about um, increasing our social media um, um, influence or, well, I'm, I'm tired, y'all. I can't even think straight. I, 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 <laughs> the presence, the presence on social presence, media. Thank yeah. you, thank you. <laughs> yes, actually there will be discussions regarding that and some of the, uh, what comes out of this will be things that uh, Flock and me can work with. Uh, we are also looking at perhaps bringing on a marketing consultant. Uh, that will probably be for the next fiscal year. But yes, what comes out of this, we will also address what can we put on social media that would be effective. Any other comments, questions, or concerns? I was excited to read it. I mean, I will say, you know, knowing that this is kind of a platform that we haven't engaged on, and, you know, right now, even if you look at our Facebook platform, the unfortunate thing is you see multiple, multiple SEMA um, <laughs> pages. And so I've had folks to say, well, which one? Even just now, me trying to see the Facebook Live, I couldn't find it. You know, so that's, you know, obviously an error. You know, so how do we get to it very quickly and then, you know, kind of delete the other stuff that's on there and that so if, if we can't find it as council members then imagine our constituents you know so i think that 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 says a lot to how we can rebrand if you will you know ourselves to a manner that would be conducive for um folks to get to us very quickly and to be able to really um talk about the great work that it that is being done by the sema team um so i i'm really excited about this opportunity yeah, FEMA team and board members. <laughs> yes. I wanted to add quickly that I think it will be um, really helpful to have some streamlined, um, I don't want to say goals, but overarching um, themes for the team. Mm -hmm. So exactly what you said, um, Chair Hughes, um, just, you know, more purpose and strategic planning with, um, you know, posts um, as well as um, even visuals. I think it'll be really great um, just for us to have some, uh, good content um, and just to to dedicate time to that. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to that team. We've already they already know our brand, so or they already know us. So um, mm -hmm. focusing on that branding, I think, will be really helpful and will save us a lot of time. Um, so be great. Perfect. So I just Here. need if oh go ahead. You know, I, I just wanted to make a comment, too. And, and Chair Hughes, Flock of Me has been doing a, a great job with the marketing and some of the things that she's, she has been working on. So this yes. isn't, you know, anything against the, the work that she's been doing, because she's been doing an outstanding job. But this is in addition to and a defining point. We need, we need people, when somebody says SEMA or Council for Minnesotans of African Heritage, they're like, boom, I know who they are. They do amazing work. They're rocking it out. So that's what, you know, they, they're making a difference in the community. And so we need to make sure that we're doing whatever we can on our end to ensure that they know that. So with that, I just need, um, I need to call for a motion um, for someone to make a motion for us to approve the NECA Creative Consulting um, Marketing Proposal. I move, Nadine. Please. 
Thank you. And then I hear, um, <laughs> I hear you, Carl. So we also have Councilmember Crawford. Uh, we'll, we'll assume that's a second. Any further yes, discussion? <laughs> All right. If hearing none, please, um, by vote, um, if you approve, uh, aye. 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 Um, any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. And the next, the next proposal is uh, for some organizational development and strategic planning. So this is another um, a document that was sent out uh, for you guys to review. So this one is a little different. Uh, this really is about developing who we are internally. So most of it is focused on the staff. Uh, as you know, we are a fairly new staff. Theo and I, we're just both a little bit over a couple of years. Flock and me, just a little bit over a year. And Ash, I mean, they're new. They just really got here, right? And still trying to figure figure things out. So this proposal is to do some team building, some internal work to review the, the strategic plan that was uh, provided by the actual council and to see how do we look at the the actual plan of the board and how do we implement and develop strategies for for the staff so it's about our internal work uh, this proposal is coming from uh, karen de young de young consulting who did the actual strategic plan for the council board uh, a few years ago uh, so she will be working with us. The, the, the plan is to have some retreats um, as well as coming together, figuring out, okay, how do we do, do this thing and be successful at executing um, our charge? The other piece of this is we want to do a retreat for the board. So this would be something we're thinking about at the end of June, um, a retreat. Friday, we come together, have some discussions about whatever we need to. We haven't fleshed that out. Have dinner, maybe spend a night. I don't know. It depends. We're still looking at what that would look like. But then having a full day on Saturday. There are discussions that need to be had, like uh, one of the things that came up, African Americans and African immigrants, how can we best come together to drive strategies for all of our people? So there are different things like that that could possibly be on the agenda. The other thing is, just like we don't know each other, I've probably seen Ash and Flock and me maybe five, six times, right? But the board doesn't know each other. It, it's important for us to know each other again, to build trust to build that space where we can have those difficult conversations we operate in a in a space where everything is a difficult conversation just based on who we are but in order to have those where we can have um engaging dialogue and discourse without people being offended we need to know each other um and and we need to talk about the issues you know frankly about what's going on in our community so a retreat will be a place where we can do that and then again focus on goals and where do we where, where do we want to go how do we want to move forward so a part of this proposal is um, the hosting of a retreat for the board members as well so I'm asking for the board to support this I I think it's a it, I, I'm a hundred percent behind this work so are there any questions or comments? in reference to this. So as you all know, we went through the strategy planning and I think adding this additional layer to, um, you know, seeing how the staff can get involved and then really how does this align with their work plans um, is ideal. And because um, De Young Consulting has um, done some work with us in the past, I think she knows the council well enough to, to be able to kind of continue on this work and help with implementation. Um, I will say I see Wayne, you unmuted, and then Andre, you did too. So maybe Wayne, and then um, and then Andre, and then others. Yeah, I, I just followed to what you're saying because that's uh, basically I wanted to go there. The work they did for us before the strategic plan, if this somehow can be incorporated in terms of uh, 
some sort of SWOT analysis on where we are with that, to incorporate that into this uh, uh, project would be a good idea so we know how the implementation of what we say we're going to do, how is it going, what we did well here, or what else we can do. So I'll support that if we can incorporate that. Thank you. Andre? Yes, yeah, so just for clarification, um, so the strategic business plan and the retreat are both one proposal, not two proposals, right? That That is correct, because okay. there's already an existing strategic plan for the board. Okay. We, as a staff, need to figure out how do we um, implement pieces of that. Um, like I said, because we're so new and because, you know, 50% of us been here less than a year, a year. Mm -hmm. And so we felt as we've been moving forward that there were, you know, questions as to how do we execute according to that plan and to the mission of our organization. We we know in general, mm -hmm. but we we felt that, you know, we need some we need some development. And then also the board needs to relook at the strategic plan, and then think about, okay, where do we even go from here? And, and as to um, Council Member Doe's point, how are we doing? And and do all the are all of the council members on board? And and again, it's an opportunity for us to connect and to uh, develop a deeper relationship. And they would be facilitating the retreat using the strategic business plan and formulating, you know, the conversations. Right. Got, okay, I just wanted to make sure I had it straight on. Right, okay. right. <laughs> and, there, and there may, you know, there may be, for example, with the board's retreat, you know, maybe there's a piece that we feel, okay, let's bring in an outside person to do whatever it is. So there may be some of that. I don't know because we haven't completely identify exactly what's going to occur, um, but we would be open to that because, you know, there there may be a, a piece or something that we want done that maybe we know somebody's an expert at external. So, so all that, but this is the proposal that is on the table and we don't really plan on spending any additional money to bring in other people, but, but it is an option. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I would just say, just so that for clarification, the strategic plan that was done was not necessarily for the board. It was for SEMA um, because the constituents, it was outside constituents, it was internal um, you know, constituents that were actually used. So I think where this piece would be uh, just for further um, clarification would be because of the fact that the folks that are, are um, a part of the staff was not necessarily here. So how do we encompass what was already done? And then, you know, how do they internalize it? So we know externally what we need to do, but how does the um, the team, the staff really kind of take the plan and really try to execute? But I think it also opens up for opportunity for um, you know, the De Young and Associates to really say, well, is it, are there some missing pieces? that what are some gaps that you know were actually kind of put forward um based off of what was done previously and then also where are some things that we know we're doing but we we're not there's no metrics to it right so how are we quantifying or qualifying what's been done to know was it a good thing that we were doing or because we've always done it this way we continue to do it but probably we don't necessarily um you know need to do that as well nope i did see her hand um thank you ash um you know so that's the other piece that um that i think adds value to that um to that question that you know you raise and also vice chair doe raise as well so um Council Member um, Lee, go ahead. So my question is um, in regards to, um, I'm wondering about, um, will there be an opportunity or has it been taken into consideration re, um, re redesigning, restructuring um, in a more intense, 
in a more intentional way, onboarding of board members, how that how we will bring people on board and and some of that intersectionality that you guys are discussing, um, will that um, be a part of the strategic planning and a part of the board development? Well, I think at this at this point, whatever that agenda looks like is it's it's open. So I wrote that down, and then if other people have suggestions, um, but I think that that piece right there is a is a good one about okay when we do bring on new board members, what does that look like, um, and how do we make sure that they're fully integrated and that everybody knows what their roles are within within the board. Uh, so I did write that down, and as we look at the planning for the retreat, um, we'll look at that as well, uh, and then we'll look at any other ideas that the con the council members have regarding re the board retreat. And I would say just to to your point, um, Council Member Lee, I think that's something that even the executive team can can have that dialogue, because I don't know if that necessarily for the onboarding piece, I don't feel like that's necessarily a strategic planning piece. I think it's more of how do we change our processing that we've been doing. The unfortunate thing, um, and I know it feels like everybody's using, you know, um, the pandemic as an excuse, but that's reality, mm -hmm. is I think that some things have gotten lost and missed in the midst of that with, with being, you know, kind of virtual. Um, one of the things that was mentioned right at the cusp of us going through the strategy planning was how do we um, reinstitute the board um, binder? There was a binder that we used to give out, and we kind of really started going back to that to say, how do we look at this and who hasn't received the binder? Because I would I would say the majority of the people on this call have not. Um, and, and so when we were meeting, this was pre-Linda, um, where we had run across that we had these binders that had all the information of um, what's supposed to be done. Um, and we had just started to, you know, kind of go through that. And then, of course, wow, yeah, COVID hit, and then we kind of just lost all um, track of, well, one, we weren't allowed to go back into the building. So stuff was shut down. So I think that that caused us really to kind of say, how do we take where we are and move forward versus, um, you know, now that we're um, back back into trying to be a little bit more hybrid because um, we're not quite face-to-face, -face, but there have been some hybrid hybrid aspects I think that that raises a good point, um, you know, so I think that that could be something that we definitely put on our agenda item, you know, to have us have that discussion as an executive team, um, because I would like to even see that happen, because what used to happen is myself and, and the executive director would meet with oncoming um, council members, but I think it is advantageous to even understand who the executive team is um, before you start moving forward, you know, and then how do we give, you know, time for folks to even give a quick snapshot, a quick 30 to 60 second elevator pitch of who you are, um, you know, and then kind of building that camaraderie. So, I mean, I, I, I love that idea of how do we look at that as well. So thank you for raising that. Mm -hmm. And so Ash is going to look for the binder that you mentioned. Yeah. They're going to see if they have something. If not, if anyone has still has their binder, we'd love to take a look at that. Okay. If we could borrow it or something. Any other, did that answer your question? Um, Yolanda, I don't, I don't want to presume that it was answered. <laughs> Yeah, I think that it, it did answer, it did hit it spot on. I um, I think that that, um, you know, we've all, we're all new. We don't know one another. And I think as we're talking about moving forward and looking at, we're talking about rebranding, I think um, we need to also look at, which I think everyone has already said, um, that that read, what does that look like? How does that define us? Are we aligning when we, you know, we might think we're aligning and may not be so that we're all on the same page and, and we all feel heard and included and, and all those things. And, and that we're doing this, you know, with integrity and authenticity to our, to our constituents. 
Um, I I really think that that rebranding process needs to go, you know, as you as Linda said, inside and out. So it did answer. Perfect. Thank you. So with that, um, I just need a vote for us to approve the DeYoung uh, planning proposal. So moved. Or a motion, I should say. Sorry. <laughs> so moved. Um, so it was moved by Daniels. Is there a second? Second. Dukes. Thank you. Um, seconded by Dukes. Um, any further discussion? If all are in favor, um, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to SEMA staff for the reports and that will close us out. Okay. Block me. Would you like to go first? Um, yeah. <clears throat> so, sorry, I'm just trying to get my notes. So we kind of mentioned a few of the things I was going to go over. Um, but um, if uh, some of you, I think we discussed this previously, but Ash is the person who um, is taking over for the bulletin. Um, and so it is doing that um, fully now. Um, and the team supports Ash in terms of sending out information. So if there's anything that you have um, that she would like to send over for the bulletin, feel free to um, to let us know so we can put that in. I know Chair Hughes sometimes sends um, job um, descriptions and things like uh, job openings and things like that. So we definitely welcome that as well as information that is out in the community. Um, and in terms of Juneteenth, we did talk about that a little bit. We are looking to um, try to do something um, within the state uh, on Capitol grounds. However, there are a couple community Juneteenth events that we are looking for, looking forward to attending. Um, particularly um, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Brooklyn Park, uh, Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center, and then hopefully um, Duluth and maybe Rochester if we have the capacity. So um, we would like to just kind of throwing it out there to the board. If you have the capacity or are planning to attend some of these Juneteenth events, um, to please let us know so that um, and if you would like to volunteer on behalf of SEMA, that would be really helpful just because we can't be everywhere at once and we would like to be in more places this year. So um, let it, yep. And we do have t-shirts um, and it's a great opportunity just to, you know, kind of table and, you know, meet folks and things like that. So if that's something that interests you, please let me know. Um, it is April and time um, really ticks quickly. So um, I would love to have us attend all of as, as many Juneteenth events as possible and, um, it'd be great to have the board support that. Um, we are also continuing to do, I think I mentioned this last time, I can't remember, but um, we are, will also be continuing our listening sessions this year. I'm planning on uh, doing an overview of how that will look like. Um, the goal is to have two done before the end of the fiscal year. Um, so I'm working with Linda on how that will look and we'll have additional details for everyone next month. But um, this year we are planning on doing more in-person listening sessions um, in the Twin Cities, but also outside of the Twin Cities as well. Wow. And we'll be targeting certain areas and communities. Um, so um, we've talked to a few folks on this already before, so we will be talking to you again. And if you have additional communities that you think, or areas or communities that you think that we should be having these listening sessions with, that would be great. Um, and this work really helps us get some feedback from the community in terms of how they felt like the session went, what they think, um, what they have, if they have any feedback um, for SEMA and what they're looking for um, just in terms of um, government and um, any concerns that they have. Um, and then we also talked about branding um, and just, again, I think that will be a really great opportunity for us to really solidify who we are as an organization and save us time. Um, and having NECA Creative do that, I think, will be really great just um, for us to coalesce together and be on the same page in terms of what um, SEMA 
who SEMA is, what that looks like, et cetera. So I'm really excited about that um, as well. And I am, as the session ends, we are uh, continuing to publish. Um, we're, we're, we're working with Reggie, who does some of our content creation. I don't want to say content, but he does some writing for us. Um, and so um, we're connecting with him to see how we can kind of push some of the work that we've been doing um, behind the scenes and get that out to the public, either through press releases, but making sure that we are communicating that with the public. So you should be seeing some things in the coming weeks, um, days to weeks, about some of the things that we have supported throughout the session. Um, and then we, um, the, the next thing I wanted to mention, and I'm not sure, um, sorry, Ash, if I'm going to take your thunder on this, but we did, um, publish some work on the website. Um, the um, annual report, and that has been shared on our social media platforms. And that's something that hopefully we will get some support with NECA Creative. But right now, the goal or the idea is to publish things that are only supported, that are only government entities, mostly because um, even though we do have partners, um, Government entities are close partners, but we kind of just want to streamline what we're sharing on those public platforms just because they do represent SEMA and we are a government entity. Um, and then finally, this weekend is um, our, the Mita Gala, which we will be um, attending. So if um, I, I know that Linda has reached out to some folks here, but if you have not reached back out to her and would like to attend, please feel free to let her know. I will be attending. I think it will be a really great opportunity. I know some of you have probably been to the Mita Gala, Gala before, so it's always a great time. Um, and that's all I have to Oh, actually, one more thing. I'm sorry. Issue groups. <laughs> um, you should be receiving an email from me tomorrow. Um, I'm going to be sending out two dates for next week. What day is it today? Tuesday. So Wednesday, um, Tuesday and Thursday of next week. Um, that will be kind of like an overview, of, like an issue group meeting. And I know it's been a really long time, so don't feel overwhelmed right now. Of, like, I don't even remember what this is. But really, that's kind of like an overview of um, it's related. It, it's an over. It's a group that for the public to help them get some information on, um, you know, government and behind the scenes. We do have Wintana, so she will be helping us a little bit with that too. Um, but I'll be sending more details via email. Um, and then that's it. Thank you. Perfect, perfect. Any questions for um, Flock Me before we move on? All right. Y'all can continue. All right. The Theo. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'll have a, a quick update on the work in March. <clears throat> Is he frozen? Yes, he is frozen. Okay. Well, while while he uh, is waiting to become unfrozen, I'll just go ahead and give mine. Okay, um, I'm going to make it quick. As you know, we had a um, day on the Hill, so just wrapping up some of the last-minute administrative things with that. I've uh, been doing, spending a lot of time on the Office of New Americans. And, and Theo is calling me, so his computer maybe is down. Um, so, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with that, there is a bill uh, in both the House and the Senate to create this Office of New Americans, which focuses on immigrants and refugees. So, one of the, we support the bill and we support the creation of the office, but one of the issues was that there were, there was a lot of overlap with our work and our mission. Um, and so we've been working with the ethnic councils and, and the assistant commissioner of immigrants and refugees and, 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 um, and legislators to try to iron that out. Let's see. Uh, worked on some policy stuff. Theo uh, was out for a little while, so worked on some of those things. Testified at the Teachers of Color um, 
session and then just meetings. You know, as an executive director, there's always a meeting that people want you to attend, whether it's, you know, I met with um, the uh, public safety new commissioner, Commissioner Jacobson, um, getting the NECA and the DeYoung contracts <laughs> proposals together, met with um, Senator Champion's assistant, worked with Dr. Barrage on some things, <laughs> pardon me. And so that is kind of it that I want to mention at this time. But just, like I said, a lot of meetings, a lot of trying to cook up things and a lot of attending sessions because SEMA needs to be in the room. People need to know that we we care about different issues. And so I've been doing a lot of that. <laughs> Excuse me. So, um, Ash, do you have anything? All righty, um, my camera might be acting up. So if you can't see me, my apologies. Back again, another round of speaking. Um, so I have been working on completing the day on the hill follow-up. So that's working to tie up any loose ends with any of our vendors, making sure that our vendors and our speakers have been getting the recognition that they need in our weekly bulletin and throughout social media. We're gonna be updating our website to do a big recap of day on the hill. More on that in a little bit. Um, so that's been great to just wrap that up and then get to some of the day-to-day -day aspects of my work that I haven't been able to get to because we've been in an intense round of event planning since I started back in November of 2022. Um, working on updating our website. It's been about 10 months or so since a couple of things have been redone. So that's been uploading the annual report. As Flockamy mentioned earlier, that's going to be uploading letters and statements that we've written throughout this uh, legislative session, fiscal year 2023. That's also going to be um, making sure that we're making the website more accessible. And part of that includes getting rid of all the broken links. And part of that includes reorganizing uh, the presentation of the website to make sure the data can get to people how they need it. Um, I've also been working on the weekly bulletin. And then, Narita, I saw your note er, in the chat. Thank you so much for that. Um, surprisingly enough, our bulletin is received by nearly 5,300 people across the state of Minnesota, and we do have a 20% read rate. So I would say for an agency that is by no means a marketing agency, and also we are not a heavy programmatic agency, that's a really big win for us. So as I've been in my role and taking it over from Flockamy, um, since she took it over in Jakira's absence, my goal has been to make sure that we understand like the reason why the information is organized the way it is and how to best get that information out to the public. So thank you all for contributing. Thank you for reading. And it's gotten us into a couple of cool places. So very thankful for that. Um, definitely working on some daily bookkeeping. Very excited to be learning more about accounting, some project management, um, and definitely physical office upkeep. So that has included doing an inventory, planning to an inventory of um, all the items of the office that needs to be bought, looking at some of the artwork in the office, which is one of the projects that Executive Director Sloan had outlined um, as part of our spending before the end of the fiscal year. And I will definitely be supporting with Juneteenth as I do have a passion for event planning and it's a momentous time to celebrate. So that's all I've got. Any questions? Perfect, bye y'all. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't give y'all no time to ask. <laughs> I, know, I love right. it though. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Theo. <laughs> right. Hey, my apologies for that. My my team's uh, shut down, so I don't know if y'all heard me previously, but I'll I'll give a brief update. Um, in terms of uh, budget bills moving forward, I mean the the main event right now in the legislative session are state budget bills um, by statute, as you all know, um, every odd number of year, the legislature has to pass and Minnesota government has to pass a, a new uh, fiscal year budget. Um, and, and, and so those are on the move. The, one of the good news in this uh, session is that the House and the Senate uh, along with the governor, reached an agreement very early, relatively speaking, in, in the legislative session, in terms of reaching a, an agreement on fiscal targets. 
targets for those budget bills, for those major appropriation bills. Um, and um, yeah, that's one actually one of the things that I believe we've shared that on the, in the newsletter, um, or we will um, in the future uh, in terms of those those specific fiscal tar targets. Um, in terms of our own engagement with the process, I mean, doing research on how the, the uh, provisions that we have been advocating for um, this this session and, and in previous sessions. Um, one key one being um, related to the discussion we, we just previously had with Dr. Barrage around um, alternatives to exclusionary discipline um, and um, and basically a broader um, uh, investment in um, having more inclusion or in a culture of inclusion in our schools. Um, and there are various um, facets of, of that, um, including the, the training around um, alternatives to exclusionary discipline, student support services, um, but then also culturally relevant um, educational services and um, and to increase um, black student, uh, black teachers um, in the classroom, access to black teachers, etc. Um, so various various packages, various provisions around that. Uh, in Specifically, uh, in May or in March, I'm sorry, we we sent letters and we had some engagements around um, the uh, uh, yo. Maybe try turning off your camera because we're you're sounding like a robot right now. Uh, sorry, y'all. Is, is this better? Can you hear me? Yeah, way better. Yep. yep. Okay. I, I mean, well, we will have we 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 have these updates that we're we're pushing in the in the bulletin, um, and uh, please, you know, please uh, um, contact us if you have questions about how things are moving along um, in the session, or if you have certain priorities that you uh, want to discuss. Uh, we we as Linda said, we've been engaged with the Increased Teachers of Color Act. Um, we had a um, a letter out on Minnesota uh, the, in support of a bill for the Minnesota Association of Black Teacher uh, Black Lawyers. I'm sorry, um, that would be for Black pre law student support, and um, and we've been partnering with uh, other ethnic councils around ranked choice voting um, to make some some uh, improvements in that bill measure. Um, so I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there for now, um, and I'll take questions if you have any. So I think you're going to have to probably go back because you we missed a chunk. Um, it was basically what you had said right before you turned off your camera. We missed that piece. Oh wow! I, I know. So I'm keeping y'all. I'm keeping y'all extra long. That's, I'm so sorry, y'all. Okay. That's oh my okay. goodness. Okay. Okay, I mean, well, I mean, the basic uh, the the update that I had um, is is with regards to the development of the state budget bills, um, which have to pass in this fiscal, uh, what we call the fiscal year in the legislative session, the odd number year. Um, so that's that's of primary importance uh, uh, this year. So that that's that's the main event right now in the legislative process in Minnesota. Um, the Key update in relation to that for March, and I'm hoping y'all can hear me right now. <laughs> uh, the key update with that is, is that the legis the leaders in the House and the Senate and the governor reached agreement on fiscal targets for those budget bills. Um, and and um, and the good news of that is that uh, they, I mean, that's a pretty early period in the session relative to previous sessions, right? Um, in which they 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 actually came to agreement on those fiscal targets. Uh, so that is there, and that gets things moving in terms of the the flow of those budget bills out of committee and meeting the the deadlines um, that they've set for major appropriations. Uh, so at, at this juncture, I mean, as things are, we have uh, major budget bills that have been moved out of their initial, their main committees. Um, at least some some initial prioritization has been given to them in terms of approval of them um, by that April 4th deadline. 
And and now these bills in the House and the Senate will will take their course um, through the finance committees, um, the finance committee in the Senate and the Ways and Means Committee in the House, and then go and, and receive floor votes. Um, and if there are differences between the House and Senate versions, then we would have um, legislative negotiations through conference community um, conference committees. Uh, so that is how things look. Um, if there are specific measures that you have been following or that you are advocating for in in the state budget bills, I think we lost him again. I'm here. Are you guys? Are you guys? Are still talking? I can hear you. I can hear. You. Okay, all right. I'll close it for this. I'm we so sorry I told you all. I, I feel bad taking up people's time. Um, um, if yeah, I'm, I just I call out that if there are things that uh, that you're following uh, or you need assistance with, please reach out um, uh, because we certainly are, are rooting for uh, some major transformation um, uh, with the investments that we'll have in this year. Perfect. No, thank you. Um, any, I think we've heard from everybody. Um, any comments or concerns from anybody? Are there any announcements? I wanted to mention something. I totally forgot to um, say it, um, but uh, Department of Human Services is having their COVID wind down rollout. So you might have been seeing some of those things. I just wanted to bring it to the attention because um, you might hear some community members asking about that, um, especially in relation to SNAP benefits and things like that are kind of being wind down. I've been talking to the community engagement my community engagement counterpart there just to kind of talk about what that means for our communities and things like that. So um, if you have questions, um, I'm, I'd be happy to talk about that either now or at, after the meeting. Perfect. Any other announcements? And Flockamy, just real quick, is it something that you can send out to as, you know, as a like a little follow up? Oh, you're you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, I can send a, a follow up, um, and they are going to be sending us information to put in our bulletin. Um, but I just know that people, especially when we think about just how you know black communities are disproportionately, you know, just like we are disadvantaged in general, just, and the cost of food is really high right now. It's just you know a couple questions of like what does that wind down look like right now, things like that. So um, I, I'll, I'll definitely send updates as I hear them. Thank you. Perfect. So do you have, Flockamy, do you have the information in regards to um, the health benefits that are being um, also sunsetted at uh, the end of this month, as well as um, many of the uh, African-Americans that um, had qualified for SSI? as well as um, some of the children's disability programs are also being sunset and are being recertified as disqualified um, using the COVID mm -hmm. um, rubric as being um, the reasoning for um, some of these folks losing their, their benefits and um, definitely um, health benefits and one last thing, we have um, a disproportionate amount of individuals who need, who have uh, Medicare, Minnesota Care, et cetera. However, providers have now, um, last count that I heard on Monday, uh, we've lost almost a fourth, a quarter of the providers who had been accepting Medicare. Uh, Minnesota Care and PMAP um, services. So uh, we're going to have lots of um, troubled it, trouble in our community around lots of things. Yeah, I hear you. I completely agree. And those are the questions that I was asking um, too, because it, it's it's just not a good time. You know, um, even before COVID. Yeah. So I. I I have been asking that, and hopefully we'll get some answers on that before the wind down um, ends. Um, but I'm I'm really concerned about that as well. I have some of the information, so okay. I'll email if it you to please. You. Yeah, that would be great. Um, yeah, and we let's you know chat because I'm I'm curious as to how 
if there's anything that they've considered, considered, considered um, to extending. So they are not. Okay. So I see um, Council Member Dukes, you had unmuted, and then I see Council Member Daniels, you also have your hand raised. I was thank you. I was going to try to put it in the chat, but just wanted to let folks know that um, NAS is having our annual um, Soar North Gala on May 6th at the Armory, and the incomparable Diana Ross will be our featured what? guest. Wow! This evening, um, and if you are interested, I can send the information about how to um, obtain tickets. Um, <laughs> It probably costs more or costs less for the council to get a table, but um, I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you, um, Linda, about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome! Wow. How can we get front row seats? Okay, like that part. Seats. <laughs> get a table. I yeah. have a huge bag. <laughs> right. I'll look at the community job. engagement budget and we'll get. That. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You all Thank do a great you. job. Uh, Council Member Dukes last year. I mean, it was fantastic. Thank you. But we'll dive, we we definitely can get a table. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member uh, Daniels. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I have one announcement and then a request for an update. Um, so I'll do the request for an update. Like, um, I got an email from you, fucking me, that there was um an event. Um, to remember April 6th, one of the deadly um, yeah. events that happened in Liberia. I was just wondering how that went. It went really um, well. Sorry, I forget when I was literally coming in from Liberia. So. Yeah, it actually went really well, Afreda. Um, I'm actually, um, the group is going to be emailing out the video so I can email it out people or like the recording so I can send it out to folks if they're interested, but it went really well. Um, and it was a good connection between trauma um, and trauma healing. So, um, it, in just historical context. So, um, I thought it was good. Thank you for asking. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you. And then another announcement. Um, over the years, we've had a lot of issues with this, um, um, African Americans and Black community and the disconnect and trying to find a way to connect ourselves and harness our power. And I also realized that history also play a key part. A lot of Liberians are actually <laughs> Black Americans because um, when when the slave trade was supposedly ended in the United States, they took African Americans back to Africa and they landed in Liberia and they called that home. Um, till now, some of them still own their um, citizenship. Actually, my father is from here. Um, so there's a thin line sometimes when we say African-Americans and Black. Sometimes it's, some of us are, are left out and there's that gap of history that's missing. Um, because of that, after I visited um, Liberia, I've decided that every year I'm going to take a group of two Two, two groups of 15 people back to Liberia to learn our history and have people reconnect back to the land. So if you are interested, we're taking our first trip in February. Please feel free to contact me directly, and I'll be more than happy to take folks back home, um, back to Liberia, and um, kind of show folks the, the history and the culture of that land. Thank you. No, that's awesome. Thank you, Alfreda, for that. The the one thing I will say, um, the piece that you talked about with the disconnect, we're hoping that that will be a part of that strategy planning, right? Is how do we, you know, because that, remember that was one of our, our components from there. And so how do we add that aspect to it as well? Um, and so you bring up perfect timing to bring that up because I think that that is a uh, prime time for the young and associates to bring that aspect of how do we do that. So thank you for that. All right, with that, um, it is 8.04. If I can have a motion to adjourn. So moved. No moved, Crawford. No. All right, and we are officially adjourned. We do not need to vote. Thank you all. <laughs>